So, my name is Deborah Ashheim, and I make installations, which are, you know, a lot of you I'm sure already know, these sort of room-sized environments that you walk through. Um, I pretty much have had one idea my entire life, which is to try to make um, invisible things visible. Um, so that's sort of what my work has been about. I'm really interested in um, things that we can't see because they're microscopically too small or because they actually have no form, um, but that are really important for us to understand the world. I use technology sometimes in my work, but it's mostly because it's such an important part of our life. And the last thing I'll say as introduction is my background's in anthropology, so in a sense, I kind of make um, sort of ritual spaces for, for confronting ideas that are important and abstract and maybe terrifying and we can't see them so we need and although I'm showing you images like everybody else I don't make glowing two-dimensional images I make three-dimensional things that are the size of your body that you move through and that's really important this is probably the first thing I showed in LA this is an installation at Raid Projects which was a gallery downtown I was interesting interested in the blurring of lines between bodies buildings and machines in the way that bu that buildings are sort of like our, like our bodies. They've got a skeletal structure, a skin, they circulate fluids, they regulate their temperature. And more interesting to me, particularly this became important to me after September 11th, they have, uh, they have their, oh, they're starting to have their own sort of neurological systems. They communicate with other buildings, they, they guard against intruders, they're becoming smart buildings, right? This is an installation I made at the Armory Center for the Arts. So something that's really critically important to me, but too small for us to see, is our visual system. And this is a 40 foot long sculpture based on the cellular retina. You guys remember studying rods and cone photoreceptors, and some of you guys might work with them now, but anyways, it illuminated the separate um, visual pathways for your rods, rods and cones to let you see in color and in black and white. These are, you know, these are the bipolar cells that carry um, electrical signals back to your um, ganglion cells and then eventually back to your optic nerve. It was a, um, a programmable light sculpture that showed you the structure that you were using to see the artwork. And when you stood on the first floor of the armory, you saw this clear and, and <coughs> rational and easy to understand wiring diagram and it made you feel like we're, we're a computer or a machine, but when you entered into it, you were in something that was incredibly complex and that was much more complicated and difficult to understand and maybe more frightening and weird. And, that, and that's sort of been my experience infiltrating the kind of like uh, sacred spaces of laboratory science. Um, this is a, a project that I worked on for three years. It was a series of six installations that was called Neural Architecture. And each installation, it was a narrative that was told across the six projects. Each one got smarter than the previous one. So in a sense, it was kind of like um, uh, it developed five senses, but it wasn't quite as literal as that. Um, the sculptures themselves were based on, if you look under a microscope, at the cells of the cerebral cortex, so the thing that we were just looking at in the last presentation. Um, these are the different sorts of cell types. But the first installation, but it was, um, it was sort of thinking about if a building had a nervous system, what would that be? So its long title was Neural Architecture, a smart building is a nervous system. I mean, sorry, is a nervous building. Um, the <laughs> tripping over my own words. Um, the first installation in the series was, an okay, so all of these installations were animated by consumer electronics that I thought of as like the analogies to our nervous system. The first installation in the series had a really rudimentary structure, like it kind of looked like a clusters of jellyfish, and it responded using motion sensors like you guys might have on your porches. Um, so that the cells would light up when it sensed your skin temperature. The second installation in the series had a, a sense of hearing from baby monitors, you know, those devices that come with all babies now. This is the third <laughs> one, it's at, um, it's at Laguna Art Museum. This is around 2004, and for this installation, neural architecture started growing a visual system through little embedded spy cameras and Casio pocket televisions. There were three rules that this series was based on. One was that each installation would be smarter and more complex than the, next, than the previous one, for example, in the cortex, as it, de as it develops more sophistication, you start to have these columns that are arranged geographically for different kinds of processing, visual, auditory. So in the third installation, it's starting to develop these columns, and it's developed this visual system that as you enter the space, you realize you're participating in the building spying on you. Um, the second rule for, this, for the series of installations was that they were all site-specific. They took their form from the space they were exhibited in. And the third and probably most important rule was that my series of installations existed in a symbiotic relationship with the consumer technology 
um, industry. What do I mean by that? It means that it took products had to trickle down to the consumer level before my installations could absorb them and use them to get smarter. And sort of arbitrarily, I define something as part of our everyday material culture. If it costs $50 or less, and you could get it at Target, Rite Aid, Circuit City, or Home Depot. <laughs> so, um, so that's you know. So for this installation. Um, a really great thing happened. This is at Otis College of Art and Design. You can see that the structure is organizing itself in sort of, into sort of like a central processing unit surrounded by other cells. It's made up of 260 of these cells. And in the summer of 2007, DVD players went down to $50. So neural architecture could start to develop a memory. Here I am standing in the center, central chamber of the installation and I'm surrounded by 23 monitor cells. Some of them show me myself back at myself. Some of me are sort of extending out across the campus and showing you surveillance footage from the rest of this heavily monitored space. And then some of them are showing you neural architecture's memories. These are its memories. And you know, I'm mimicking the kind of time-lapse videos that biologists make in the lab. <laughs> So there were a series of these installations, and I worked on this project until 2006. The final one was organized into specific columns that either processed new information or had memory, and it integrated all the senses together. And then like any person who's worked on a project for, um, for a series of years and gotten up every morning and known exactly what they had to do, and they just had to take that project for further, I felt a little bit liberated and largely terrified when my project was over. But the idea that I was still really interested in was this idea of memory. We talk so much about memory now, we've got digital memory, we have many prosthetic memory devices. I haven't memorized a phone number probably in eight years, you know. And, um, and if my computer's in the shop, I feel like part of my brain is missing. But then, and also for, for all, pretty much all of my career, I'd, I'd made work for interesting, for like compelling personal reasons that had been largely silent in the work itself. Um, and the sort of secret backstory to neural architecture was while I was working on all of these structures that were very much based on the cellular structure of the brain, people in my family had been getting diagnosed and slowly dying with various kinds of Alzheimer's disease. So when I, I became really interested in memory in a critically important way, which was that as memory got erased, people that I cared very deeply about were also getting erased. What was memory? What was me well, the relationship between memory and the self? Were, is the brain a computer? Are we machines? What happens, when, what happens to what you think of as something metaphysical or philosophical or poetic when these structures break down? So I started making work partly out of, out of the symptoms of some of my relatives. This is a drawing called Both Kinds of Kinship. And one of the things that was the most distressing to me, and some of you might have family members with, with these diseases, is, the, is people who are close to whose inability to recognize it. So in anthropology, we often mapped kinship networks. And this is, this is my, um, you can't really see because it's kind of low resolution, but this is a lot of little blobs. And they're, and they're um, people that are related to this. Me, my sister and brother, their kids, my parents, my mom's side of the family, my dad's. That's my network of consequentity people I share blood with. And this is my network of affinity, all my friends on the West Coast, my friends on the East Coast, my friends in Europe. And I was like, oh, good, that's <laughs> out. I've got that. Everybody's mapped. I know where they are. They're not going to wiggle around. They're not going to get erased. And so I started thinking, what else is in my head? Because I was surprised as I drew this to realize that I was remembering more people than I thought. And I started thinking about mapping information in my head. Well, I was up at Headland Center for the Arts, which is a really neat artist residency colony in Marin. And a couple of the other artists there, um, their names are Daniel and Annie, and they're architects. They have a practice together. <coughs> and they worked very closely, and they were giving a talk. And somebody asked them, what's it like to work so closely with someone who's also your partner? And Daniel said, oh, yeah, you know, it's kind of like we share a brain. And I think I'm, like, really literal. You know, you can be in the lab, and scientists will say, we use this protein, and we light up the cells. And I have to go run to my studio and light up the cells. And so I had to map how Daniel and Annie share a brain. This is Annie. She's Korean. Um, she has a sister. She was very sick as a child. Daniel is from Seattle. He wears the same sweater every day. And this is their shared <laughs> brain. They, have, they worked on all these projects together. They have the same birthday. They have the same obscure allergy to dairy. This is a, this is a mapping drawing that comes from a, sort of a classic question they ask amnesiacs in, um, in psychology clinic, which is, um, it's a prompt for recalling information. What did you spend cash on last week? So this is everything that I spent cash on between September 7th and 14th, 2007. Things that I wanted to spend cash on, like candy and raspberries and beer, are sort of pink, and things I had to buy, like 
tampons and cough medicine are yellow. <laughs> um, the other thing I do, I'm sure none of you are afflicted with this, but I'm really, really busy, and when I get incredibly busy, um, instead of doing any of the things I need to do, I just start freaking out, and each thing reminds me of something else that I need to do, and I just sort of worry about it. So now I don't even try. Now I just kind of map that, so I'm interested in what it would look like. And so these are worry drawings from May 2006, October 2006, and, and um, December 2006, and it shows you how each worry triggers a whole another cascade of worries. And the ones that are red and throbbing are ones that I'm going to get in trouble if I don't do. And then like purple ones would be something like prepare my TED lecture where you know I want to do it, but no one's going to like sue me if I don't. <laughs> and, and, and in this drawing, I was in, I was so um, behind on, on working on everything that by the time I got back to coloring the same half of the things were or a fourth of them were finished. So the reason I'm telling okay, so so this is an example of the kind of installations I make. This is at the mattress factory. Um, which is a really cool museum in Pittsburgh. And they basically, it used to be an old mattress factory, and they give each artist a floor, and they say, you can do whatever you want. And so, you know, another thing that, um, another thing about my grandfather was, he was like, a, he was sort of like a really withdrawn, taciturn New Englander, and he had he never kept his hearing aid turned up loud enough. And he also was the guy who was always kind of hiding behind a camera at family events. So it was very difficult to tell when his Alzheimer's really started, because he wasn't that checked in. And I, so I never felt like I really knew him. But when he died, I inherited the memories he'd lost, in a sense, because I inherited 46 carousels of slides that he had shot, as well as his photo albums and, and movies that he had made. And he was shooting color 16 millimeter film in the 40s. And my dad also had taught a bunch of, of 16 millimeter in the 60s. So I made an installation based on clips of all of these movies that they had taught. And, and all of them sort of predate my conscious memory. Either I wasn't born yet, or it's that period of early childhood amnesia. You know how we can't remember anything until age like three or five. But the memories were incredibly reactive for me. They would trigger these chains of associations. And so I mapped those out in, these, in, in this installation. This is three different generations of little girls in our family playing Ring Around the Rosie. My mom and her friends in patent leather shoes, me and my sister in 60s sundresses. It's the, that's the only video I made, that's my nieces. And, um, and then this is probably my favorite um, thing that my dad ever shot. I don't know how many of you guys have read Lacan. If you went to art school, you had to, and if you studied psychology, you did. But he talks about the mirror phase, which is when the baby first looks in the mirror, and then somebody, usually one of the parents, says, that's you, and you start to realize that you have an independent, autonomous self, and that's where your self-narrative, the story of your life that you carry around with you, and is why memory is so critically <coughs> important, begins. I believe this is that moment, and some neurologist yesterday agreed with me. See here, this is the baby me. Now, 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 clearly, I think this is a different baby, right? I'm looking at another baby. I see this baby, I'm happy, someone came over to play. I try to kiss the baby, you'll see. Oh, now, wow. wait for it. She says, that's you. Birth of the self. Um, so, you know, a lot of times when you walk in a museum, I think we're all trained to do this, you run over to the wall and you read this text that tells you what you're supposed to think and get out of it, and then you go look at it through the filter of the sort of like um, invisible cultural institution that's telling you what you're supposed to learn, and, and I, I hate that. Like, when I'm in a museum with my parents, I block that with my body and I make them look at it the, and try to talk about what the work is about before they do that. So I didn't want to do that in my show, and you know, I have this whole floor. And so I decided to take part of the space. There was sort of like a little room that the elevator opened up to before you went into the bigger space. And instead of telling people what to think, I, so I decided to tell them the much more complicated story that was the context for this piece. <coughs> so every night when I worked on my installation, because this is an, a, a really cool museum, they give you a house and tons of assistance and all the resources you want to make your piece. I went to Zurich for a while and they just kept working on it. And, um, and so at night I would call all my relatives that had been the caretakers of the people in my family who'd gotten sick, and I'd ask them to tell me stories about them. But I didn't want to just know stories about their, what them when they got sick. I want to know who they were when I didn't know them, and what was their sense of humor, and stuff I'd miss. And I sort of tacked that stuff up on the wall. I was working with my grandpa's photos printed out. And the really cool thing was people would come into the gallery, and they would pull me down off the ladder, even though I was clearly busy, and they'd start telling me stories from their family that they remembered when they were reading my stories that they somehow had to tell me. Or they would see something that would look like an old photo album picture of theirs and they want to say there's a picture of me and my sister it looks just like that you know, we had that same 
print press or something. But a lot of this drawing was about my Aunt Dee Dee. And my Aunt Dee Dee probably had the most terrifying, she was my great aunt. And she was an editor at Harvard, and she was married to um, S. Stanley Stevens, who was actually a really famous psychologist. And he, he was in the lab with W.H. Sheldon and B.F. Skinner, which meant a lot to the people yesterday and maybe less to you guys. But, um, <laughs> but anyways, he wrote a handbook Skinner, of experimental yes. psychology that was sort of like the main text for um, psychology students in the 50s. And Dee Dee edited all of his books, and she never had kids. And her whole life was verbal and intellectual involvement. And so it was particularly tragic when she developed aphasia because she lost her ability to speak. She was completely cognitively intact. But it was like she would forget the name of something, and then she forgot the name of more things, and then she forgot all the names of everything. So some of the things that this drawing was about were, were um, things that are incredibly like sad and poignant to me, but at the same time, the best conceptual art projects I've ever heard. They were ways that people in my family, when they could still do the sort of executive things that they usually do to manage their memories, and we all do these to a degree, writing on notes and leaving ourselves little lists, and they were trying to hang on to something. It was like they were, they were trying to use their, you know, and, and there's like a futility to these, um, to these attempts that are that, that are crushing, but at the same time, it re I really understand more than anything else, you know, what this would feel like. So keep that in your mind, because I'm going to come back to Aunt Dee Dee. Um, so this is another one of these pieces. This is a drawing based on a video, and it's mapping out. Again, it's a. This is a piece I'd made for the Weatherspoon Art Museum, and it was based on. Um, Birthday, you know, everybody films birthday parties, right? Like, I think what happened was my dad, he had the 16 millimeter camera. He really liked it. So he filmed hundreds of hours of me doing absolutely nothing. And then my sister came along and he filmed like two hours of her. And then by the time my brother came along, forget it. So we have every birthday party. So, but you know, I don't remember the birthday parties, but I remember the house I was in. I remember all these other people. And I remember children in the birthday parties. In one case, a dog named Tippy that I was really close with. And so, um, the, the museum said, make drawings. We want people to be able to follow along. And so that, this was that piece. And then as you got in closer, you saw this is my mom teaching me how to blow out the candles at my first birthday. My mom was really hot, right? So anyways, um, so one of the things that people would tell me when they saw those, those pieces, because I remember when I started this work and I was thinking, I'm really scared to make work that's autobiographical. Nobody is going to be able to relate to it. This is the most narcissistic thing I've ever done. It's gonna, and, and actually, people would come up to me and they would say, I have to apologize. When I was looking at your show, I was trying to pay attention to your family story, but I kept going off on these trajectories. I kept having this experience. They didn't say it like this, but I'm going to translate that cognitive psychologists call mental time travel, where you sort of like go away and, you're, and you re-experience this other memory and then you come back. And I was like, that's not something to apologize for. That is so cool. That's my favorite thing anyone could possibly say to me. That means instead of illustrating this phenomenon, I'm catalyzing it. And I liked that so much that I was suspicious because I said, why would someone tell me something that's so much what I want to hear? OK, well, I'll come back to that again in a second. So this is a drawing I made, another one of these information drawings. This is my friend Christine after I'd known her for one week, because I was at this artist colony. And I thought, I know just enough about this person that I can map it. And if I know, find out anything more about her, it's going to be too much for a drawing. So I better do this now. So everything I knew about her from observing is mapped in red. Like she looked like a boy when I first met her, and she always had yogurt for breakfast, and she had a Swiss accent. And everything I knew about her in green is stuff that she told me. Like she was from Bern, and her sister still lived there, and she had four little nephews. Hopefully you can see them that they live like little blobs. Well, when I was in Pittsburgh, the University of Pittsburgh, some scientists from the program in Cognitive and Effective Neuroscience said, hey, we really liked your show. Why don't you come over to our lab? We want to do some experiments with you with your work. And I said, great. You don't have to ask me twice. So I went over to their lab, and they had my drawing queued up on a monitor. And they put my head in, I don't know what it's called, the thing that holds your head in place. And they, and they had me read through my drawing. And at this point, I've known this girl for nine months. I know a lot more about her. And they said, well, we, were make, we made this eye tracking drawing while you looked. And this is everywhere your eyes went and where you stayed in the drawing. And it starts out with black, and it ends up with orange. And it shows you with like sort of this time-based you know, um, movement of my eyes through the drawing. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. And they said, Oh yeah, that's nothing. While we were making this, we were making a movie. And this is a movie of your pupil dilation. And pupil dilation is another index of brain activity. When, when you get, when you are in, in psych terms aroused, which just means thinking really hard or having an emotional reaction, your pupils dilate. So this circle is showing you what my pupils were doing as I, as I was making that other drawing, right? And um, 
and I don't remember what I was thinking when I was rereading through this drawing anymore, but I know that like that one minute right after, you know, there were certain things in the drawing that were really emotionally charged for me, like boyfriend, because I'd heard a lot about this girl's boyfriend by then, you know, and like other things that had happened to her. And when I got, when the circle got to those parts, it got like really big, and I was like, oh my God, the machine can read my mind. <laughs> and, um, and even though I'd been thinking about, you know, we have a real problem in this society with this brain-body disconnect. Nobody really deals with the fact that they have a brain and that everything is stored there until it starts to break. That was shocking to me to really realize that there were, you know, that my autonomic nervous system was giving away all of these cues about how I was feeling inside. And so they said, let's do a real experiment. We have a new three Tesla scanner and we're taking pilot proposals to do projects. And I said, let's, you know, you want to do something in the fMRI. So I said, I want to test this thing that people tell me about, about remembering their own memories when they look at my videos. Can we make a, can we do an experiment where people give me their home movies and we have mine and we see what's going on in people's brains when they watch personally relevant and not relevant memories. So that was this experiment and this is my brain. And then we also did one where I made worry maps for people and then we got to see what was going on in their brains as they worried. This is your brain. Yeah, and you know that was the first time I ever saw it. It was amazing, and like that sort of, and that's my face. <laughs> and, you, you know, they, they make these images all the time, but because of patient confidentiality, you can't, you don't usually get to see them. But you know, I think that's a lot of what I've been really interested in the past few years is trying to just make that more real. You know, and the, so the really interesting thing, the upshot of all these experiments, which cost thousands and thousands of dollars and used all the scanner time, was my friend Greg Siegel, who is the um, primary investigator on this project, went and presented at National Institute of Health in Bethesda at Grand Rounds, and he thought they'd be interested in all this sexy, expensive fMRI stuff we didn't. They just were interested in the worry maps. They thought we'd invented a therapy and they wanted to have their patients do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I said we'd come back to my Aunt Dee Dee. Um, I, I'm really worried about getting aphasia. You guys can probably tell that I kind of like to talk already. You probably know that I went over my minutes, right? And so that would be the worst kind of prison to me, is to be trapped in this body, having all my thoughts unable to express them. Some neurologists believe that you have separate pathways for semantic information, which is like word knowledge, and for phonological information, which is like auditory knowledge, sounds. So I decided, you know, I back up my laptop really faithfully once a week. Why can't I back up my, um, my linguistic information, my verbal knowledge, right? So I got a bunch of, um, of musicians, and the most important one is a woman named Lisa Mezzacappa, to write songs for my 25 favorite words so that I could relearn them and then store them in a different part of my brain with pathways that were less likely to be affected by disease progression. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a sculpture that plays a song for the word tarmac, which was my first computer password, and it's a very private song, it, and so um, only one person can hear it at a time. But this, and then this is a sculpture that plays the song um, for the word node. And, the, and part of why I built sculptures, so these sculptures are kind of like to give bodies to these songs and to make them into like um, physical things. And it was partly because the songs were so awesome that they deserved their own sculptures. Um, and this, and, and a lot of, and this is, would take too long to explain, but a lot of it also was about, we live in this sort of screen-based earbud world and wanting, and everything I do is always about trying to put your body back into the space. I'm gonna show you a little bit of one of them. Oh yeah, this has a lot of speakers in it. Um, this is for the word palimpsest, and um, it gives you a sense of the installations and also my archive of my grandfather's images is used in this. Faded and painted over, painted over. All human history, ghost drawings It's the simple things that change over time, over place, faded and painted over, painted over. Well, this is on my website if you guys want to watch the whole thing. <laughs>